Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, for an engaging discussion into the latest cutting edge approaches to understanding, researching, and treating Parkinson's disease. Um, we have an all-star group on the panel today, including our longtime uh, collaborator and close colleague, Dr. Loren Studer, uh, NICEF innovators, Dr. Vikram Kurana and Malin uh, Parma, and Dr. Gist Croft from the NICEF Research Institute. And of course, as always, our stellar moderator, uh, Dr. Reka Iyer. Parkinson's disease remains a major challenge for both researchers and physicians to tackle, and patients still have no disease-modifying therapies. Um, it's unclear why some people ultimately get Parkinson's, while others with the same or even supposedly a higher genetic risk don't. Uh, the power of stem cell science gives us a human patient system, a human lens in which to unlock these mysteries and understand how individual patients differ um, and why some people get sick and some people don't and uh, why some people get sick and have a completely different range uh, and intensity of sy symptoms from others. Uh, stem cells have also opened the door to advanced treatment strategies that were not possible even a few years ago. Um, above all else, we really believe in the power of collaboration and team science um, we need all of the best brain power to come together to address society's most urgent needs, including finding ways to halt the progression of and reverse and even cure ultimately devastating diseases like Parkinson's. Lorenz, Gist, and, and Vikram are part of a multi-institutional team that was awarded a consortium grant last year from the Aligning Science Across Parkinson's Initiative, ASAP, um, which is focused on using stem cells to study how risk factors accumulate and interact to drive Parkinson's disease. The team is taking a really comprehensive look at the interplay between genetics, aging, and different brain cell types, and how they trigger certain individuals to develop Parkinson's. I'm really looking forward to hearing the latest on that project tonight as part of this conversation. Um, and before we get started, um, I want to recognize the transformative partnership and critical support that we have from the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, uh, which makes um, our education and outreach programs possible. Uh, we currently have a matching grant challenge from SNF to help ensure that we can continue this work. So if you enjoy our virtual programs, any support you give to our education programs will be doubled we really need it and are very grateful for your support. Thank you so much. And now it's my pleasure to welcome all of our panelists and to introduce our moderator, Dr. Reka Iyer, uh, NICEF Associate Vice President of Scientific Outreach, who will moderate our discussion today. Reka. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, it's really a delight to be here with this group of fantastic panelists from the NICEF community. Um, who are doing some of the most exciting work out there in, in Parkinson's disease research. Um, since we will be talking a lot about stem cells, I wanted to start us off with the very basics of how we use stem cells to advance Parkinson's disease research and treatments. And this, this comes from a technological breakthrough that happened uh, recently, one of the greatest breakthroughs in biomedical science in recent decades. And that's been the ability to sort of turn back the clock on our adult cells, um, taking a sample of skin or blood and being able to make that into what we call an induced pluripotent stem cell or IPSC for short. And this is, this is done through uh, a, a combination of factors known as Yamanaka factors uh, developed by a scientist who later won the Nobel Prize for this um, because it was such a fundamental breakthrough. And the reason that it's such a breakthrough is that these, these stem cells are basically avatars of the, of the patients from whom they come. They contain the genetic code of those, of those patients and they can be converted into any type of cell in the body. Um, so in, the, in terms of Parkinson's disease, that means we can convert them into the neurons that are affected in the disease and into all of the different types of brain cells that we're gonna talk about today that are affected uh, in Parkinson's disease. And with these cells, we can do a whole lot of different things. We can fuel disease research to help to understand how these patients are developing Parkinson's disease to begin with. Um, what are the triggers? What, what, does, what are the effects? Um, we can test drugs in a dish. 
um, to see which, which drugs might be able to sort of reverse the effects of the disease and make the cells look more like healthy cells. And we can even look at developing cells for replacement therapy to replace the neurons that are damaged in Parkinson's disease and put back healthy ones so that the patient can regain uh, the function that they've lost. And so we're going to hear about all of these different kinds of approaches uh, today from our excellent panelists who are working in all of these different areas. And uh, I want to thank all of you from, who have submitted questions in advance uh, from the audience. I will be incorporating these uh, as we go along. And I want to invite those of you here with us to share your questions using the Q&A function. Um, please do note that as we are not able to answer any personal medical questions, we'll be focusing today's discussion on the latest research, current treatments, and the road to better treatments and cures being developed by a lot of our panelists today. So I wanna start by bringing on uh, Lorenz Studer, um, who is the director of the St Center for Stem Cell Biology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center here, Cancer Center here in New York City. Um, Lorenz, you have pioneered the use of a lot of these stem cell approaches that I just described here for, uh, for studying Parkinson's disease. And you've also critically recently figured out how to incorporate age into these models, which is really so important for an age dependent disease like Parkinson's. Could you give us a quick overview of that work and the questions that you're addressing right now? Sure. First of all, just thanks Rika for this introduction and Susan obviously as well for the invitation. So as I said, I'm sure we will have a chance to talk about all the different aspects that you as you mentioned in your introduction, because it's an exciting time for us, both on the side of really developing cell therapies, but also for really using stem cells as a model to understand the disease. And again, to directly address your question, with regard to aging, obviously age is a very important risk factor in Parkinson's disease. In fact, you can easily argue it's probably the largest risk factor if you just look by percentage, because very rarely there's a child that has Parkinson's disease. Even middle-aged people rarely get Parkinson's disease. And typically it's 50, uh, it's 50, 60, 70 or 80 year old people that get the disease. And obviously the question is why? We know that's not only for Parkinson's disease for many other disorders, but really the way my lab got really fascinated by this question is not only the need clinically, but the fact, the technique they described, the Yamanaka technique, What's really absolutely fascinating, not only do you reprogram your skin cell into a stem cell, but it looks like if you do that from a person that's 99 year old or 10 year old, it actually, that cell seems to go back to the same age. So not only do you lose the identity of the cell, you become a stem cell, but you seem to also lose the age, which is actually kind of a crazy idea because that would argue that aspects of aging might be reversible. And so it's very interesting to study that obviously, but it's also a problem because now we have these stem cells that are matched to a given patient, but they are young. They're kind of the baby version of a, of a dopamine cell or any other nerve cell of the brain. And now we have kind of the opposite problem. We wanna figure out how can you make those cells old at the age when people do get Parkinson's disease. So on the one hand, it's a technical challenge. And so that's something we try to solve. We can artificially trigger age, like in a movie where you fast, fast forward the age, there are diseases, for example, where you get premature age, children are five or 10 years old, but they look like they are 70 years old. So we can take their gene, put it in our cells and try to fast forward age. But we do that in many different ways too, uh, on a technical level, so that's a challenge, but it's also very exciting because we think theoretically that could be a really interesting way to also treat patients. And if you think about it, maybe if you could really slow down or even stop that neuronal aging process, might be helpful not only for not getting Parkinson's disease or having it not progress, but maybe might even help for other neurodegenerative or age-related diseases. Yeah, really interesting. And we will definitely be coming back to the topic of aging because I, I know lots of us want to hear more about that and how we can reverse it. But um, in the meantime, Vic, let's go on to you. Um, you are the chief of the Division of Movement Disorders at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. You're also a NYSEF Robertson stem cell investigator, and you led some of the first studies to identify and reverse the features of Parkinson's in stem cell models and have done some really exciting work on genetics. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're focused on right now? Hi, thanks so much, Reiko. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Nicef. It's great to be here. Um, 
Yeah, as you say, the, the stem cells give us a window into individual patients. And what we're really grappling with in our group is the heterogeneity of Parkinson's disease. You know, you mentioned right at the beginning, we don't have a disease modifying therapy. The question is why? Do we, do we not have the right hypotheses in the lab? Do we not set our clinical trials up correctly? And everything in between, right? So there's so many what there's so many potential reasons for us not having a disease modifying therapy. But the one that we are hooked on right now is that Parkinson's disease may be more than one disease. We know that there are clinical subtypes of patients. We also believe there are molecular subtypes of patients. So if you think about the cancer field that has had the ability to model uh, cancers in the dish for decades because they've you can take a cancer out and grow it in the lab. We haven't been able to do that for a privileged organ like the brain. Um, well, in cancer, there are huge insights into this issue of molecular subtyping and matching a patient to a particular therapy. That's not a disease group that is solved by any means, but it's certainly a disease group that shows us that stratifying patients into different subtypes can be very therapeutically beneficial. And so one possibility is that when we do a clinical trial in Parkinson's disease, we're taking apples and oranges in and we're using a single approach that could be working for a subset of those patients, but we would never know because we don't understand how patients are different from each other. And so, so our lab is integrating genetic information from patients and using stem cells created from those patients to understand whether specific genetic markers may be related to specific subtypes of the disease. And the way we do our analysis is we center on a particular protein called alpha-synuclein. And that's because there's one hallmark characteristic feature of this disease. No matter what subtype you have, we know that the protein alpha-synuclein aggregates in the patients who have Parkinson's disease. So my lab tries to make roadmaps, for want of a better word, of how this protein perturbs cell biology. And we use those roadmaps to understand the genetic information that we're getting from our patients, because we know that protein is deeply involved. In turn, we test our hypotheses that certain genes are important, in the stem cells that we make from those patients. And one of the things that we've been very interested in doing is reversing those pathologies in stem cells, like you mentioned. Uh, and we've made some, uh, some findings there, especially where we can define the mutations in the dish. And the big challenge we're working on now in the lab is what about most of the patients for whom we don't have a clear genetic cause? And so what we're collaborating on with with, with GIST and with Lorenz in the context of the particular grant you mentioned is, is that very problem. How do we understand um, that large majority of patients uh, and, uh, and really break it down to a tractable problem in the lab? Thank you, uh, Vic. I think and that's a, the genetics question is really important and we're gonna spend some more time on that uh, later. So um, I next want to move on to, uh, to Gist Croft, um, who's a senior research investigator here at the NYSEP Research Institute. Uh, Gist, you oversee our uh, Parkinson's disease and neurodegeneration uh, research. And you've done some great work in the past on ALS and Huntington's disease, um, also neurodegenerative diseases uh, using stem cell models. Can you talk a bit about how that's informing the work that you do at NYSEP and what your current focus is here? Yes, sure. Um, you know, thanks so much, Reka. Uh, in your introduction, you mentioned uh, that one of the, the ways that we study disease using stem cells is to make the disease relevant cells. And, you know, traditionally, that's been the neurons that are dying. They've been kind of the stars of the nervous system. Um, but, you know, most of the brain is actually made of cells that aren't neurons. So these are glial cells, we call them, which is glue. It's what's in between neurons. Um, and increasingly over the past several decades, uh, people have become more and more aware that these cells have crucial functions both in uh, maintaining a healthy brain, but also uh, really intriguingly in um, enacting the, the programs that are happening in neurodegeneration. So uh, in ALS, for example, 
um, there was a, a striking series of studies that um, astrocytes, a particular type of glial cell, was actually targeting and killing motor neurons in the spinal cord. It's now become clear that astrocytes uh, are um, trafficking in this alpha-synuclein protein that Vic just mentioned in a, a deleterious way. They're actually impinging it upon the neurons and helping to kill them. And they're not the only glial cell that's involved. So my current focus, uh, which dovetails with some of my previous work, but, but really is unique to PD, is to expose the role of glial cells uh, in this kind of um, you know, degenerative process. And the other, uh, I would say, uh, particular unique focus here at NICEF, and one of the reasons I came here, um, also connects to what Vic's saying about the, the um, heterogeneity of patients and stratification of patients. So at NICEF, we have a unique capacity to make tens, hundreds, thousands of stem cells from thousands of patients, and not just to model um, very well-controlled models, which actually we're very excited about doing with Vic and Lorenz and others, but to look at how um, cells from patients across broad categories um, and across broad populations um, perform and you know, how we can use th those numbers actually. Um, you know, at first, it seems like a, a negative thing. It's so diverse, we can't figure out what to do. But actually, by looking at large cohorts in parallel, uh, I think we can learn things that we wouldn't by looking at cells in isolation or learn new things. Right, exactly. And like the subtyping uh, aspect of it that, that Vic had mentioned, which is going to be relevant for therapeutic development. And we will uh, definitely come back to that to that some more as well. Um, I want to now welcome our final panelist, last but not least, uh, Malin Parmar, who is a professor of developmental and regenerative neurobiology at Lund University in Sweden, um, coming to us from uh, close to midnight there, so we very much appreciate that. <laughs> Mullen is also a NICEF Robertson Stem Cell Investigator alumna, uh, and she has done a lot of fantastic translational work on cell replacement therapies. So as I mentioned, you know, the opportunity to create these neurons that are, uh, that are dying or damaged in Parkinson's disease and put them back into patient brains to restore function. Um, so Mullen, can you tell us uh, a little bit about how you've been approaching this over the years and, uh, and the current focus in your lab? Yes, thank you, Rika, for uh, the introduction, and thank you to the whole NICEF community for inviting me from uh, Europe to uh, partake in this uh, super interesting uh, evening. Um, so, in terms of stem cell replace or cell replacement therapy for Parkinson's disease, I worked in a center in Lund where this was pioneered uh, in the late '80s and early '90s, where patients were transplanted with cells that was collected from the uh, fetal brain. And these are the neurons that would normally go ahead and form the dopamine neurons. Uh, and those studies already at that time showed proof of concept that this could work, not for all patients and uh, not under all circumstances, but it definitely was something that could give very long-term benefit for the patients. The problem at the time was uh, the lack of tissue and already then, uh, it was realized in the field that we need to have a renewable source of cells. Now, that was easy to kind of postulate that uh, need, but it took uh, decades uh, for the field to actually uh, find the cell source uh, and also to find ways to direct stem cells uh, towards dopamine neurons. So in the meantime, I was involved in doing another fetal VM-based trial called TransZero. And that trial, uh, we finished transplanting the patients a couple of years ago, and the primary endpoint point is just up. But during this time, uh, there were some great developments in the stem cell field, both in terms of making human embryonic stem cells, which are pluripotent stem cells, and then the induced pluripotent stem cells that Reika was talking about uh, in the very beginning. So these are... Uh, great because once they're generated, they divide almost for, well, virtually forever. So you can just make more and more of these cells. And over the years, uh, and Lorenz has, of course, been a driving factor in this field uh, because these cells have the capacity to form any cell type in the body. So they have the capacity to form dopamine neurons. And quite early in the field, you could learn to direct them towards dopamine neurons. The problem is that not all of the cells made dopamine neurons and it wasn't very clean differentiation protocols, but in the last five, 10 years- Did you we, say what you mean by differentiation protocols? Oh, so this is when we tell the stem cells to become a neuron 
and then also tell them that they're supposed to become a dopamine neuron. So uh, to do this in a streamlined fashion uh, turned out to be quite difficult and the field just reached there a couple of years ago. So Lorenz have a trial about to start and we have a trial about to start and there's a trial that has started in Japan where these pluripotent stem cells that have been made into dopamine neurons are transplanted to patients with Parkinson's disease. Great, and I'm definitely looking forward to hearing the latest on those. Um, but I wanted to start um, the overall discussion with talking about the state of the art in therapies currently. So part of, of course, why we're here has been, you know, this unfortunate lack of, uh, of disease modifying treatments. But I want to hear from each of you, you know, sort of what are, what are the symptoms that currently available treatments are able to help manage and what, you know, are any of these able to, to slow or stop or, or reverse the disease? And um, we could start maybe with uh, Lorenz. Sure. I'll be happy to give you my, my uh, take on it. And obviously we have Rick here who actually treats those patients every day. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but I mean, in simple terms, it's basically that we have symptomatic treatments. So once you lose those nerve cells that produce the dopamine, you can basically try to just simply give a precursor of that dopamine to the brain. And that actually has been a revolution about 50 years ago when this was first tried on patients and there were patients that were completely frozen, they would be able to walk again. And the unfortunate part of that therapy is that it really works worse and worse as the disease progresses. So it's, it's temporary, a good benefit, and it basically obviously only affects the, the symptoms from those dopamine cells. And so that's, that's kind of the mainstay of the therapy together with a surgical intervention, which is called deep brain stimulation, where you don't really do directly anything to those dopamine cells, but you try to kind of circumvent by properly stimulating the brain, their function. And then there are experimental therapies. We've heard just one from Marlene. And again, we are very much involved in that with cell therapy. They are not approved therapies yet. So they are still all experimental, as well as gene therapy trials. The number of ways you now where people try to put gene back, either try the remaining cells that are still there, make them function better, or maybe have other cells in the brain take on the function of dopamine cells. But even those are typically mostly symptomatic treatments. So, I think the main conclusion is there are some treatments, clearly that if you go to neurologists, and again, I wanna have Vic talking more about that, but, but I think there's a clear big need to have something that really prevents the, can fight the progressive component, and maybe again, can even treat symptoms that go beyond just the dopamine cells. Thank you, Lawrence. Vic, please uh, add to that in your experience as a clinician. I mean, I, I think Lorenz summarized it all, and I'm happy to flesh out different parts of that. Um, but but we, you know, we have a very complex multi-system disease here. Um, it's really important for us to obviously think about and address the motor symptoms of this disease. But for those who are on this call who are patients or caregivers, you will know that this disease has many features that go beyond even the motor system. So so Lorenz is split up the motor system into you know symptomatic treatments which will improve your symptoms for a while but don't change the ultimate outcome of the disease and then we can think about disease modifying therapies that will preserve those motor circuits uh, and that would be great and we're all we're, we're you know we're all very interested in those kinds of therapies but we shouldn't forget that Parkinson's disease starts likely decades before the motor symptoms. It has autonomic features. Uh, you have changes. Could in you explain autonomic? Yes. Autonomic features are, um, uh, are features that we have no conscious control of uh, in the nervous system. So if we think about our bladder function, our bowel function, our blood pressure regulation, these are critical you know, life functions, but they are not under voluntary conscious control. These are autonomic functions. And Parkinson's patients, um, you know, have experienced a lot of effects in these other systems. And one of the most dreaded effects in Parkinson's disease relates to change in cognitive function, which which um, which could lead to uh, to uh, you know significant changes in quality of life and and even in some patients to dementia, frank dementia. And so we have to think about this as a multi-system disease as well. And I think that's just one um, one point to add. Uh, and in each of these, there are going to be symptomatic treatments 
And there are, for example, if patients come in with bladder dysfunction or dysfunction of blood pressure, we have very effective medications uh, for these symptoms. Uh, none of them change the ultimate outcome of the disease. Um, so I think that that's, that's one important extra dimension to just factor in there. Thank you. And I want to talk about just sort of how some of these therapies that, uh, you know, have, have been developed. And we've, we, you know, we've heard a lot of recent news of uh, failures in clinical trials from molecules that have been discovered uh, using mouse models, for example. Um, could you talk a bit about that and how, uh, and how stem cell research is, you know, gives us the opportunity to kind of overcome some of those failures in clinical trials going forward? Right. So one... You know, one point is that, of course, the, the, the trials can fail for many different reasons. Um, and so, you know, one possibility, one of many possibilities, is that there are human specific aspects to the biology of these diseases. Um, and whether you're going to be replacing a cell or whether you're going to be thinking about a, how a cell becomes dysfunctional, um, humans are not mice. Now that doesn't mean that we can't learn a lot from mice. Uh, you know, in my work, I learn a lot from yeast cells, which have evolved billions of years before us. We, we have, you know, we have a lot to learn from different organisms. They can all teach us something, but there's certainly evidence growing that aspects of this disease, aspects of the dopamine neuron biology, for example, in humans versus mice, um, you know, are quite unique to humans. Um, we know that there are subtypes of dopamine neurons that are more susceptible than other dopamine neurons in the human brain, and we need to better understand those differences. And so I think from different angles, all of the panelists here um, uh, have bought into the idea that we should be studying uh, human biology and its complexity, um, but studying it in a tractable way that, that is, is reproducible and robust in the lab. So just to speak to that particular point, I think in general, um, therapies that have worked in mice have not so far worked out in humans. Uh, and that may be related partly to the differences in human versus mouse biology. But it also may relate to a point that I raised before that humans are complex and there are subtypes of diseases and, and that genetic complexity or that gene environment complexity is not found in our mouse models. And so we need to understand the heterogeneity as well. And, and one way to get at all of this, whether you're doing cell replacement or whether you're, you're studying the biology of the disease processes is to create human models. And that's why I think we're all here. Absolutely. Anyone like to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just add that, you know, just to reiterate that sometimes the first time a compound in a drug trial sees a relevant human cell is in a human patient. And, you know, we all certainly believe that it's now possible to introduce those compounds and test them on cells in a disease relevant model for earlier than that. And just to add also that um, uh, Vic mentioned earlier the stratification of patients according to genetics or symptoms. Um, people have gotten smarter about, um, you know, doctors and clinicians, scientists about designing drug trials. And with the genetic information, there, there are currently pretty exciting drug trials based on disease modifying mechanisms targeted to specific subtypes of PDs. Oh, so that's, that's something that should be uh, noted. And that's, that's pretty exciting. Maybe just one more point uh, there's obviously also, I mean, again, I, I introduced already the topic of age. No, there is also the fact that some therapies might not work at all the stages of the disease. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly uh, for some of the, the therapies that were tested recently, you know, where this might well be the case that we cannot treat the patient early enough for actually the therapy to properly function. And so it might well be that we need to have different therapies for different stages of the disease and maybe something like the cell replacement where you actually try to put new function back with new and young neurons, maybe that can work even at the later stage. Now once the cells are already gone, but if you obviously have a disease that affects a specific cell type, we talked a lot about these dopamine nerve cells, by the time a patient has the disease, already probably more than half of them are gone and they rapidly degenerate further. And so then again, it's very difficult to, even if you stop it, no, you don't have so much left. And so I think it's very important also to find the right therapy for the right stage of the disease. And there's a lot of effort in the 
field disease. Well, maybe we need to recognize early and early disease before you even come to the neurologist. That might also be very, very helpful and there are big efforts from various organizations trying to get us data, what is what we call a biomark and now some signal that maybe predict that you're gonna get a really strong disease later on. And I think that's gonna be also very important to get even better success in the disease. In addition, obviously to stratifying the patient, so separating the patients into different pools based on their DNA and the genetics. Right, yes. Yeah. So but Colin, of course, you the, stem to... cells, the stem cells can also help us to make an earlier diagnostic uh, and also to make a differential diagnostic. So, to, so both to diagnose early, as Lorenz said, by the time most patients get the diagnosis, they lost half their dopamine neurons. So already at that time, you're quite far into that part of the degeneration. But with the stem cells, you could potentially also use some. Uh, so I'm working on a couple of projects here in Europe where we try to do prodromal diagnosis or to, to, to actually diagnose Parkinson's disease before the majority of the neurons are dead. Mm -hmm. um, and the other th point I wanted to make was that right now there's a lot of exciting developments in terms of different therapeutics. And they're kind of developed as single therapeutics, but I think that in the future we'll do combined therapeutics. So you could very well uh, combine both new drugs, maybe vaccines with cells and gene therapies and DBS, you know, all, uh, and you can kind of have, uh, I think the, they need to be developed one by one, but once developed, I think that they can be used together. Absolutely, thank you. And we will definitely come back to combinatorial therapies and emerging therapies. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, what we're hearing so far is that a part of the challenge in, in treating Parkinson's disease is that we, there's still a lot we don't understand about what's actually causing the disease. Um, so for example, we've had a question about whether there are deficiencies in more than just the, uh, the DOPA uh, molecule that's the uh, sort of precursor to dopamine and other neurotransmitters that, that drives the disease. So I wanna spend some time talking about what we know and what we don't know about the causes of the, of the disease. So um, Vic, let's, let's start with talking a bit about genetics. We hear a lot about genetic risk factors for Parkinson's disease. So does that mean that it's an inherited disease all of the time or uh, you know, we've had questions about it suddenly appearing in families with no history, for example. So could you talk about the, what the latest understanding is of the genetics behind the disease? Sure. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, we, when, we, when we don't understand something completely, we call it complex. And so, so, um, so Parkinson's disease is called a complex genetic disease. And the reason for that is that it's thought to be um, an interrelated uh, etiology interrelated cause between what's what's in your genes and what's in the environment. Um, and so you might have a vulnerability um, uh, to Parkinson's disease, but never get it. Your genes may say you're vulnerable, that you've got a specific mutation that puts you at higher risk of the disease, but you never get that environmental trigger that tips you over the edge. Um, and so we think about, we have to think about it from the most simple cases to the most complex cases. And the most simple cases are those in which a single genetic change lead to a, you know, an enormously, in, enormous increase in risk for the disease. Um, and these are often very rare patients where there's almost 100% certainty that the presence of a single change in the genome can lead to the disease. But that is a very small, minority of patients. And in those patients, you will find that that, pa that, that disease tracks typically 50% um, of each, each, each generation of a family is affected by the disease. Um, and so that is, that is, those patients are rare, but they have been incredibly informative in teaching us that there is potentially uh, a strong heritable component to this disease. And in some, some patients, it's particularly strong. So that is a small number of patients. And now you get to, um, you get to that next category where there are some genetic factors that are not, not quite as strong as that, but we've been able to identify them. And, and we know that they confer increased risk. It's not quite as dramatic as those really rare mutations, but it is it is, it is far more 
than you know than the average uh, than the than someone in the average population, let's say, and we call those heritability factors, and we think that you know about thirty to forty percent of someone's risk, at least as you look across a population, is related to genetic factors, and so. But, but it's not that you just have a single change and, and we can really say that, you know, this is your percentage of getting the disease. It's more complicated than that, as I said. It's probably multiple genes working together in conjunction with environmental factors. And then finally, the largest category of patients, unfortunately, are those in whom we suspect there is likely a genetic component. Um, but we do not have any real insights yet into what that genetic component is. And so this is a spectrum of very strong genetic to minimal environmental, all the way through to modest genetic to strong environmental. Uh, and there are many ways of getting at what the relative risks are. Uh, you know, you can study monozygotic twins, twins that have exactly the same genetic code and, and, and start to ask, well, if one of them has Parkinson's disease, what's the chance of the other one having Parkinson's disease? And there's, and there's population-based studies as well that can give us a good estimate of, you know, the relative contributions of our genes and our environment. So hopefully that's a way to at least open the discussion. Um, but as Gis says, that this is, this is, um, a very important area because we have certainly identified some families where there are these strong genetic changes and those, uh, those patients with those kinds of mutations, um, many in the call will have heard of LRRK2, LRK2 or GBA, um, uh, the Gaussian protein, those kinds of genetic changes are now being very informative for stratified clinical trials uh, to try and make a more homogeneous patient population to enter into um, clinical intervention. Right, and that point about twins is interesting because we, we did have a study uh, a few years ago at NICEF um, looking at identical twins where one had Parkinson's disease and the other doesn't. So, right. you know, that really just speaks to the fact that genetics is a piece of the right. story, but not the but in that story. case, I think, Reka, I think one of the twins eventually, uh, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, in that <laughs> study, one of the twins did end up getting the disease, but but I think many years later than, than the other twins. So, so I think that that's um, really interesting. It suggests that there was something significant that changed, you know, outside, yeah. of, outside of the genome, uh, something that changed it. We, you know, to give another example of that, we study a multi-generation kindred that actually has one of these mutations in the Northern part of Spain. We're studying many members of the family right now. We've made stem cells from the entire group. It's a remarkable family because every generation some of the family members only get the autonomic symptoms and never progress to the Parkinson's or the dementia, and we would like to find out why. Um, and so there are clearly other factors here, genetic or environmental, that we, um, right. we need to still discover. Absolutely. So another factor that we talked about is, uh, is aging. Um, Parkinson's disease usually has an onset of about uh, 60 years old. So, so Lorenz, can you talk a little bit more about how the process of aging plays into triggering uh, the disease and why people with, with these genetic risk factors that, that Vic mentioned don't develop Parkinson's as children, for example? Sure, that's obviously a very important question. The short answer is you don't know absolutely for sure what's the key <laughs> driver. But we know that many processes in age start changing, not only in Parkinson's disease, but in many other uh, areas of the brain, for example. So one very important component is that kind of the machinery in the cells that is important for energy, they're called mitochondria, they basically function less and less well when, when they age. They, cannot, they have their own genetics, their own DNA, can, can they, so they, their function goes down a little bit. That's particularly problematic for some cells like these dopamine cells. It turns out dopamine cells are one of the largest cells of the human body because actually one cell can make processes that are estimated to be several yards of length, actually, if you add them all up. They make Can about- you explain what million. a process is? So that is basically these projections that nerve cells use to connect to each other. So from one region of the brain to the other region, and again, recently it was possible to label, mark a single cell and basically count how long are they, like long fibers that connect again from a single cell uh, 
in, in the region of where the stop cells are to the region where they have to go. And that's a very, very huge, if you think of cells, no, they're very microscopic usually, you know, you need a really good microscope to even see the cells. And again, their, pro, their fibers to connect can be huge. And again, because it's so huge, they need a lot of energy. And you can imagine if then this energy machinery in the cell gets functioning less and less well, that could be obviously then endanger those cells. And there are many other kind of uh, yeah, scientific problems associated with that. But another very important process that goes actually also back to the genetic risk factor that Vic mentioned in some of those families. So some of them have to do with, with how the cell handles these proteins if it's in the cell, particularly it's alpha synuclein. So usually you have to make sure now that they get properly produced and then used up and degrade. And in this case, it happens that the machinery that's kind of controlling that, like kind of, you can think of it like the, the trash system, no, if a protein gets old, it needs to be removed. That actually works less and less well when you get older. And so you get in trouble, now you start kind of getting accumulation of trash, if you want to call it in the cells. And then these proteins have a tendency to actually interact with each other in a way that they can form kind of what's called kind of clusters or, or so-called Lewy bodies. That's a term now that can, we can see in the patients when they die in those cells. And so there's, there is another process, not only this mitochondria that produce the energy works less well, but for example, again, this machinery that has to make sure that, the, that these proteins get properly removed and the trash collection works less and less well. And so the number of such processes that are a real problem. And we actually published yet another one such process about two years ago, where a process that's called senescence. So that's when the cells kind of get very old, they basically shut down their function. And normally that was thought that happens particularly by cells when they have made a lot of other cells, eventually they kind of get nearly tired and they get old and get nearly removed. It triggered this senescence program it's called. Now we recently showed this can also happen in some of the nerve cells themselves, these dopamine cells. And so that's another mechanism that can be the cause of what happens in age, that the cells get much more vulnerable. And it's not just that you then lose these cells, they don't function very well anymore, but they kind of start secreting signals to the environment when they start undergoing that program that then activates some of the cells that kiss the studying, some of those glial cells, and it can secrete molecules that make other uh, dopamine cells very unhappy. And so there's a whole number of mechanisms, again, the energy, the proteins, the senescence process, that probably all contribute in certain ways to make, to make the cells more and more vulnerable and make this process where you have the genetic problem from the time of birth. It was always in those cells, but only then it manifests itself. And again, one of the ideas because all the defense mechanisms that the cells had, they start breaking down at later stages and therefore the disease can manifest itself. Thank you. That's, uh, yeah, definitely a very complex problem um, that, we're, that we're still working on. Gist, I wanted to, to come back to your point earlier about um, all of these different cell types that are happening. So we've been talking primarily about about these dopamine neurons, which are the brain cells that produce dopamine. Um, and you mentioned earlier that, the, that these glial cells are really important. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, what is the role of these other cell types, uh, you know, these glial cell types uh, and their interplay with neurons in triggering disease? Yeah, you know, what I'm focused on right now mostly are uh, two brain cell, glial cell types, astrocytes uh, and microglia. And astrocytes are, um, they're the most abundant cell in the brain. They, they actually provide energy um, and chemicals that are required for the survival of all neurons. Sometimes it's very specific to the specific type of neuron. So that they serve a, a function to just keep the brain working. Um, they do appear to, you know, the genes that are making these neurons, we think uh, susceptible to disease are also in the astrocytes. And it looks like they may be functioning uh, or dysfunctioning in similar ways but because that cell does a different thing, it has kind of a different effect. Uh, so, you know, we believe now that the astrocytes are failing to produce some of the factors that keep neurons alive, uh, and that they're also uh, secreting factors uh, that are, are um, damaging to neurons. So whether that's through a process of senescence where a neuron is saying, I'm sick, and then the astrocyte secretes 
uh, basically toxic factors, uh, which uh, many people have heard about inflammation. You know, if you get a wound or an injury, um, your body responds by secreting chemicals that draw the immune system in and swell the tissue. Well, the same thing happens in the brain during um, a blunt injury, but also during neurodegeneration. And it, people knew for a long time that uh, when there's lots of cell death, there's lots of neuroinflammation, which makes things worse. What we're realizing now is that that probably and may come much earlier, uh, and it may be driven by some of the same kind of genes that, that Vic has detected and other many people have detected over the years looking at particular families. Um, microglia are the other cell type. Now they are the, the um, they're an immune cell, which is the um, system that fights off uh, predators in the body, uh, microscopic predators, and, and really is th their whole job is inflammation and clearing dead and damaged tissue. Well, the brain has a resident population of these immune cells, microglia. They come into the brain when it's first forming. Um, actually, we're learning, it's a very exciting area because they help the brain develop in really um, intrinsic ways that are super important. But they are poised to respond to inflammatory signals. Um, and it looks like they too are affected by some of the muta genetic mutations and may be hyper um, you know, uh, activated, have a hair trigger um, and, and at a very early stage. So those are two cells. We have lots of reasons, um, you know, evidence to believe that these are new kind of fronts in, in looking for targets for therapy. Um, because if one is only focused on the neurons, one is gonna miss out on, on the roles of, of genes and proteins in these other cells. Um, the third major glial cell is uh, oligodendrocytes. They insulate those fibers uh, that connect neurons to each other that Lorenz was talking about. Um, and while we don't really know what's going on there, um, there's some very clear genetic evidence that they too are, are strongly involved thanks to the kind of large scale efforts at, at sequencing uh, human, human genomes. Right, okay, thank you. That's lots to still be discovered. Um, I wanna talk now, uh, Malin, about, about the uh, cell replacement therapy work that you've been doing. There's, you mentioned that there are several therapies uh, in development. Could you tell us a bit more about the current status of, the, of these, these therapies? And, and Lorenz, I'll ask you to weigh in as well on the one that you're working on. Um, you know, there was a question on what the advantages of these kinds of therapies are versus um, other types of treatments, if we might be able to foresee combining them with uh, things like deep brain stimulation or gene editing, so. Um. Yeah, I think you can foresee uh, many things, and this is just the beginning of a very exciting field, I think. The, the trials are either ongoing or about to start, have a, a similar approach in that there is one donor cell line that then is used for all the patients in that trial. So these cells aren't matched to the immune system or uh, anything like that. Uh, so the patients undergo immune suppression for the first year. Um, and what's coming in the future is many different things, but one of them relates to this, uh, whether you use one cell line for everyone, uh, or if you work more towards patient specific treatments. And today it's fully possible uh, to use, to make these iPS cells, for example, from uh, the patient's blood cells or skin cells, uh, make stem cells and then differentiate them into dopamine neurons and transplant back into the brain. So that can have many advantages, but it can also have disadvantages because I was thinking about the discussion that we just had around the mechanisms of the disease and what makes the dopamine neurons more vulnerable. I don't study so much the mechanism of the disease in that sense, but for me, it's of course very important that the cells that I make to put back in the brain actually do not acquire the disease once they're put inside the Parkinsonian brain. So uh, in that sense, if you use patient-specific therapies and you have monogenetic cases, for example, you probably want to gene correct the cells before you use the patient's own cell. The other thing is that with stem cells, I think this is just the very beginning. You could uh, endow them with capacities that they don't have. They could be either resistant to disease, they could be um, 
uh, disease modifying stem cells. You can also combine, so Vic was talking a lot about the non-dopamine features of the disease. You can combine with medical therapies, but you could also combine with transplanting several different types of cell cells. So you could transplant dopaminergic neurons and cholinergic neurons, for example, and more restore the whole brain circuitry. So where these therapies, they're just at the very beginning, but they're extremely important in driving this field forward to show that it is possible to uh, generate cells that survive, integrate and function after transplantation. And then from there, with the stem cells and the gene engineering uh, of these stem cells, there's many avenues you can take. Absolutely. Lorenz, can you say a bit more about the work that you've done that's led to this trial that's now underway with Blue Rock Therapeutics? Sure, I'm happy to do that. No, it's, as Marlene indicated, it's a really exciting time because obviously that was one of the promise of stem cell research that we eventually can do that. I started on this idea more than 20 years ago. And again, now finally, I mean, I was really happy that just last December, we finally got the green light from the FDA actually to start the trial here in the US. And actually in March now also, we got the, the green light for Canada. So it's really an exciting time where finally we can put our ideas to the test. And very similar to what Marlene said, we make again this many, many cells in one swath. So we make billions of cells. So that's kind of our philosophy. And we think that's maybe good because obviously then we can test the cells very carefully that each patient gets. But it's also maybe good if you think in the future, you know, if this is really a therapy that's going to help many patients. One big issue is with cell therapy has been cost. Some, some people in the audience might have heard in cancer, you know, where some of those therapies cost half a million dollars or more per patient because they're individualized, they're very complicated to design. And I think at least our philosophy was that we try to kind of avoid that huge cost, hopefully for the patient eventually. We don't know yet, now it's too early to tell anyone what that will cost and the many facts explain, but if it already costs that much to even make the cells, then obviously it's gonna be by definition an expensive product. So I think that's really an exciting time to now test it. And again, I don't have probably time to go into all the details of our specific trial, but I actually put the email in the chat. I think that hopefully all the attendees can see that yes. you can send to this email for more information. So what kind of criteria this patient's gonna involve that are currently being recruited for that trial. But in brief, it's basically 10 patients that you wanna have for the initial trial. And they're gonna be relatively later stage of the disease. So the idea is that you'll be 60 years or older, already five to 10 years into the disease. But again, I, I don't wanna go into too much detail. I don't wanna have anyone misunderstand things. But so I think it's gonna be uh, definitely a very exciting time and be happy to provide much more information. You can contact me or you can contact this email address. And I also wanna echo another points of what Martin made about other cell types. I think that's really interesting. Obviously, there's so many ideas we can do. And we even think that we're gonna mix different ideas. Now we talk, Gis talked a lot about those glial cells between the astrocytes and these microglial cells, the immune cells. And we are very interested to see, can we again use some of those cells and basically rejuvenate, talk about a lot of aging. <laughs> so rejuvenate, give you kind of a young, sounds a bit crazy, a young kind of an immune cell back into the brain. Because again, that's one of the problems I mentioned before, when you age, you get all these features that things don't work so well, you get more inflammation. Can we put those back? And maybe can we make them super well? Like can you make kind of a super version of it adding an additional gene that then maybe helps being so disease modifying. So there's a lot of exciting ideas. And I think some of them, again, we're testing in the lab, but one lesson that we learned, I think we have to be very patient, not only the patient have to be patient, you have to be patient, it takes a long time you now from an ID to actually getting to the clinic. It took us, we, had, we were very excited about 10 years ago and we published a big paper. Finally, we thought we can make this dopamine cells, but it was 10 years ago. We already had kind of the, the right condition, but it took us 10 years from that proof of concept, as it's called in science, to actually be allowed to go into patient. I hope it's going a little bit faster in the future. As we learn how to do it, the regulatory agencies learn how to do it, how to regulate it, because everything is very new right now. Nobody mm -hmm. knows exactly, you know, this is something going into the brain. It wants actually to make new connections, connections are going to have for the rest of your life. And so, so it's kind of a new concept of a therapy. And I think we all learn how to best regulate that, but hopefully it's going to get a little bit faster so that we don't have to wait another 10 years for the next generation of some of those techniques. Well, let's but hope I think so. you will move faster, Lorenz. I, I think that this is just at the very beginning of the field. So 
um, there will the, the process will it won't be quick but it will be quicker and especially if you do combination therapies maybe where they've been tested individually exactly yeah I and i think about that. yeah because of trailblazers like you it, it'll hopefully move faster for everybody else going forward um vic i wanted to ask you you also co-founded a, a company called uh, humanity that uh, that recently had some great news about a parkinson's drug could you that came out today could you tell us about that Right. I mean, in general, um, we've been talking about cell replacement, but now, you know, yeah. stem cells can be uh, converted into neurons and other cells and you can use them for drug discovery. And so um, we've used, uh, you know, patient derived stem cells uh, as an important component of a just drug discovery process to reverse the effects of that toxic protein that I was talking about before alpha synuclein and alpha synuclein binds to um, to, to membranes in the cell, the coatings in the cell, the, 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 where, where a lot of our fats accumulate within a cell, alpha synuclein is right there. So we discovered that if you change the components of fatty acids, you can change the way uh, alpha synuclein sticks to them. So you can alter the, um, the, the abnormal accumulation of that protein. And so, um, so in terms of timing, that initial hit from a cellular assay was, uh, was probably 2015, middle, middle of 2015. We're now into clinical trial, phase one of clinical trial. And today was press release that, you know, uh, that in patients, uh, this drug does appear to hit its target. It alters those fatty acids in patients, which means that the drug is at least doing what we think it should. And then of course it needs to be extensively tested to see if it's effective, but that's a very important first step. That's excellent news and very promising indeed to think about these other kinds of therapies that can be yeah. coming down the pipeline. Maybe just to add one point that that protein accumulates in your neurons, in your skin, in your, in your salivary glands, uh, in, in, in the cortex, which, which controls our cognition. Um, it, as I said, it's a multi-system disorder. This protein is involved in, in all of that. So if you can get a therapy that targets the protein, you might, you might target something more than the motor symptoms for the disease. That's the hope. That's great. Well, we're, we're nearly out of time here. So if for a kind of closing question, and I, I want to ask, uh, thank everybody for all of these questions they've brought in. We've tried to get to them as much as we can. So I'll invite you all to give some, some closing thoughts on, you know, what you could tell uh, a, a patient with, with Parkinson's now to, to kind of give them hope for the future. And, uh, you know, maybe touching on things like these, uh, these subtypes, how to, you know, making, if there's, that's going to be something that we can, you know, use in a therapeutically meaningful way to decide on therapies um, that, that patients need for, you know, their own personal manifestation of the disease. There's also, you know, issues like uh, racial health disparities and mortality, all of these differences between patients. So um, I'll open that up. Guest, why don't you start? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think one really huge thing uh, is that um, th there's a, 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 you know, the Michael J. Fox Foundation for many years has cultivated a community of people and funded research that uh, the federal government, uh, you know, wasn't able to do and, and built a really solid foundation. And now, um, you know, this uh, Aligning Science uh, Across Parkinson's initiative, uh, working with Michael J. Fox and others has really, um, you know, taken a step that many other neurodegenerative disease areas um, have done. I'm thinking of Huntington's and ALS, which is to say, uh, let's commute, uh, create a, a giant community um, and fund research at a scale, which allows us to capitalize on some of the really, um, you know, revolutionary advances in biomedicine. I'm thinking of um, sequencing and highly parallel processing of stem cells uh, and machine learning. Uh, and we have incorporated a lot of uh, these elements into the particular uh, little project that Lorenz Vick and, and I and, and two other collaborators are doing uh, through the auspices of that organization. But that's just a tremendous, it, it's exactly, you know, it, it leverages all of these technological and CRISPR is the other thing, um, the ability to edit genes and see what happens in, in real human cells. So it's a tremendously exciting time 
for um, you know for the basic understanding the basic mechanisms of disease, which um, you know the cell transplantation therapies are so exciting and amazing. And there's other people here who speak to them, you know, much better than I do. I'm not involved in that, but it's tremendously exciting for basic mechanistic biology, which is what leads basically to um, you know traditional drug development, which still has a, a big role, as, as Vic just said. And the other, just one quick uh, note, is that. Um, you know, NYSA for a long time has kind of been out in front in this idea of precision medicine. Let's take hundreds and, and not in cancer, but in other areas. Let's take many, many samples and try to interrogate that diversity and leverage that. Um, you know, we've now, um, you know, made an initiative to enrich the, uh, the breadth of that diversity substantially. Uh, it's no um, secret or surprise that there's been a restriction, um, you know, or, or a bias in, in biomedical research. Uh, and, you know, this is a really good and, and uh, ASAP, that organization also now has a Black and African American uh, specific program to increase that diversity. Um, as well as internationally by sequencing 100,000 genomes. This is a really cool case where ethically the right thing to do is also the right scientific thing. So the genes that Vic mentioned uh, come from very specific families and kindreds, and we've been missing out on those other genetic clues, not just for those patients, but to inform you know, how those genes are coming together. So those are two really exciting developments uh, you know, that are happening here and, and broadly across the community. Thank you, Gist. Vic, would you like to pick up on that? Well, I think uh, Gist covered a lot there. I, I think these are really, I think these are really exciting developments. I, I, I don't, I don't want to. I know we're over time a little bit, so um, I, I think that he's hit the nail on the head. We need to understand these diseases better. We need more data. You know, when I was talking about stratification of patients, um, we really need um, a lot of participation from patients, a lot of engagement. Uh, and we need researchers to be coming together and sharing their data in a timely way. Uh, and we need to be thinking very sensibly about clinical trials. Um, you know, this is something that goes back to a comment that Lorenz made a while ago, and that is that you need to define the right endpoint in a clinical trial. If you've given a mouse a drug before the mouse gets symptoms, and then you expect it's going to fix the dopamine neurons in a patient who presents, you know, at a, at a later stage of the disease, that may not be the best way to, to, to try that drug. You may want to try a clinical trial that prevents, for example, dementia in that group of patients and not, and not actually doesn't deal with the motor symptoms. So I think we need to define um, this whole process a little better. And we think that human stem cells uh, offer an opportunity for early diagnosis, looking for biomarkers of progression and targeting therapies to specific subtypes of the disease. Thank you, very well said. Lorenz. Yeah, I mean, just to echo what was said, I mean, I'm excited on basically all the different levels, clearly on the cell therapy, because again, you're waiting such a long time to now see, can we get that really into the patient? Does it work? How can you make it even better for the future? I think that's super exciting. And equally exciting, I think also is now, is all these mechanistic points, all the things we can learn from stem cells, how a disease work, they got us kind of to a critical level but I think for the first time in the field, there's kind of more excitement again. Now for many years, Parkinson's disease or other disorders in the brain, that was kind of, it was just thought to be too hard to fix nearly. And there was a lot of disappointment. And I think now, I think the hope is that this actually having a human system to start off, having all these new tools, making the stem cells precise enough that they can really predict, having machine learning, new technology flowing in, that really now maybe finally they can make a difference. And what I'm also particularly excited is I'm bringing those two things together. Again, this is my Blue Rock hat, obviously I have to make my disclosure there, but I mean, one point that Blue Rock tries to do is actually cell plus gene. So now if you take all the insights now from what you learn about the disease, take all the benefits from the cells, what you can do to regenerate the brain and take them together, hopefully the magic will happen there in the future. So I'm very excited. But again, as I said, patients still need to be patient because things take quite a while before we, we are fully ready to really engage in that. But there's a lot of hope out there that we finally can crack some of those problems. Yeah, absolutely. Malin, I will give you the last word. Can you say why you, why you are hopeful about, uh, about the well, future? Yeah, I guess it's a little bit hard to follow on what's uh, already been said, but maybe on a more personal note, I mean, neurodegeneration is, uh, 
awful uh, disease, whatever system is degenerating. And there's a lot of progress made in many of these uh, different diseases like Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS. It's not happening fast enough, um, but it's happening as fast as it can. I think that one has to be very careful not to rush. We all want them and we all want them now. Uh, and personally, I wanted them a couple of years ago when I lost my mom in ALS, but they, they're not here fast enough. But the only way to get there in the end is to move at the speed that science lets you move to develop these safe and effectively. So even though it's not, for many of you listening, no, it's not moving fast enough, but you just have to trust that it's moving fast enough and there's nothing one can do to speed up these developments more than working together, more than learning from each other and really bringing this uh, to its full potential in the years to come. Well, Malin, thank you for that. I think I think you're being very humble because people like you and everybody else on this panel are moving things a lot faster. And we're very grateful to all of you for that and for these wonderful collaborative efforts that are, uh, you know, really starting to, to bring in new uh, insights into the disease and treatment. So I want to thank all of you once again for, uh, for really in engaging discussion, very informative discussion, and thank everybody in the audience for joining us today. And we hope to see you again at a, at a future NICEF event. Take care, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.